Nick Atkinson. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Um, I was interested in um, Richard's points about design quality in the east of England, and I wondered whether, I mean, in my recollection a generation ago, um, Mel Dunbar and Essex County Council did some, at the time, I think groundbreaking work about producing design guides for residential housing. Uh, I wonder what the legacy is of that work and whether it's bled across into the rest of even Bishop Stortford and Broxbourne, let alone the rest of Hertfordshire, uh, and wh whether Richard has a view on, on that work. Well, I, 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 um, there is some interest in, in, in design guides. Um, St Albans City and District, uh, where, where I live, they, they have appointed some a third party consultant to help them with design guides. So there is some interest. It's it, at the moment, I say it's skills within local authorities to do some of this work. Um, Chris, can you help us with uh, uh, the design guides? Well, um, thank you, Richard, and hello, everybody. I'm uh, extremely new um, to the job, having only uh, having only joined CPRE Hearts a week ago. So uh, do forgive me if, uh, if if I'm a little hesitant on on some of the local. Um, I'm a bit of a townie, but I'm a Hearts resident now, so uh, and very happy to be so, I should say. Um, as far as design guides are concerned, the Essex work was absolutely groundbreaking. Um, you're right. Um, but I think it's fair to say, and Alison will put me right perhaps as well, that it didn't travel much further than Essex, although lots of people suggested that it was a lovely idea. The difficulty at the moment is that the white paper makes all kinds of expectations for design guides, design reviews and so on, but absolutely does not allow the means for that to happen. And the people who used to do these things, um, urban designers, conservation officers, heritage officers, have been exactly the cohort that has been cut um, over in um, by local authorities over the last several years. So we are in a situation where, in principle, one can be very supportive of an approach that looks at local design codes and so on, um, sort of return to vernacular and 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 um, increase the quality of design for, for, from developers but the means are absolutely um, absent from the present white paper and I think that's the real that's the real sort of missing link if you like um, and and it's going to be very important indeed for people to lobby very hard to say great idea but as in many things, where are the resources and where are the means to, to, to get those underway? Uh, just after the housing audit came out in the beginning of 2020, uh, the report of the uh, Build Better, Build Beautiful Commission was, was mm. published. Um, and um, that was a government-sponsored piece of work. The housing audit was, was done by uh, various charities. And the BBBC re um, report um, has been taken very seriously. And the government is talking about there being a default um, national design guide um, yeah. if local authorities don't have their own. But um, as Chris has said, we know no more about it than just those headlines. Alison, have you uh, uh, to add? Well, I'm absolutely right, Richard. Um, Richard uh, what Chris has said about resources, this is going to be the big problem because... These design codes are now intended to go in, of course, at the local plan uh, formulation stage. Um, and as you said, it's, that's absolutely crucial to get it in there. But as we know, lo lots of local authorities now just haven't got the resources to enable that to happen. Um, and defaulting to a national design code really won't work because what will work in Nottingham is not going to work in East Hearts and, and so on. So it's absolutely vital to have that, you know, right at the beginning. Um, I did notice there was a, a suggestion that each local authority should have a chief officer for design uh, moving forward. And, and that's great. But I just don't know where these people are going to come from, given the, uh, the lack of skills and resources that local authorities now have. So there's a lot of upskilling needed there's a lot of training um, and a lot more resources for local authorities that's needed now. Malcolm, Julie Marson has got a hand up. Right well let's let's go over to Julie then. 
Thank you. I hope you can hear me. Thanks very much, Malcolm. It's a real pleasure to be here. And thank you to Richard. I, I, we, we met over Zoom uh, a few months ago now, but uh, it's nice to see you again. Um, you. And I, I really value what you say. It's a great presentation and I really value. And I think I'm in awe of the CPRE because it's a very effective lobbying organisation. And um, so, you know, we take what you say very seriously. And, and I haven't got any fingers crossed, I promise. There's no fingers crossed. And I, 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 you know, it's not my presentation and I don't, I don't want to say too much. But what I would say is there is a very long way to go in this process, as, as Richard has said. Um, and Conservative MPs that I work with, my colleagues, have already put in a lot of comments. I have replied to the consultation. I have raised concerns about the green belt. Um, I have raised concerns. We originally raised concerns about the algorithm that was going to be used uh, to determine the overall numbers, and that has been scrapped. Such was the um, reaction amongst MPs about that. There has also been a commitment because of the reaction from my colleagues about the green belt, um, and there is going to be much more emphasis on urban areas and brownfield sites to recognise that we cannot be building on our green belt. And, and I'm very, very clear about that. Um, so, I mean, Richard mentioned so much, there is a new normal, and I think it's really important that we respond to that, where people will want to work in the future, whether they will want to uh, live more in towns, for example, to help with um, town centres. Um, we are also obviously quite fortunate in East uh, Hearts because we've got an adopted plan which will limit the immediate impact on our area. Um, design codes, absolutely vital. Really, really big fan of that because it's funny, isn't it? You know, sometimes it's hard to describe what good design is, but you almost know it when you see it. Um, and I think that's uh, it's very subjective sometimes, but it's really important. Democratic participation, one of the aims, and I know there's a lot of detail to come out here and absolutely acknowledge what Richard said on that. Um, the aim is really to enhance democratic participation. At the moment, democratic participation in local plans is vanishingly small, actually. Um, and the idea is to get in early um, to make it much more accessible, probably much more online to make it much more accessible. When that's been piloted, uh, participation has risen. So I hope that's a positive development. Um, definitely concerns about the planning inspector. Um, we've already seen um, decisions overruled locally that, that, that gives me a concern. Um, how we ensure that local people benefit from new building, um, actually, because what we do want are more homes for our children, our grandchildren, key workers, so that, that our local police, our NHS workers can live locally. Um, and you're right, I have concerns about permitted development rights as well. But my main, um, main point is, if you do have concerns, please write to me and let me know, because uh, this is a, a really long process between MPs like me who are trying to represent you and our local area and feeding all of those concerns back into the government. So that's my big message. It's been fascinating. And please email me, write to me if you have views, because I'll be in a position to feed those views up into, into the ministry and to government. And I'm really, really happy to do that. Well, one thing I didn't talk about is um, planning applications because they're included uh, um, in the, the white paper, the speeding up of the, the process or, uh, for how long it takes to do a planning application. Now, one of the key functions we have at the moment within the planning system is that most local authorities for large, larger developments, certainly usually more than 15 or 20 homes in any development, a local authority has a requirement for uh, affordable housing to be included in that, usually at about 40%. Now, an awful lot of developers then come back and say, it's unviable for me to do this, and they present a viability assessment. Now, um, there was some talk some uh, a little time ago, last year, as I remember, that these viability assessments will be made public because at the moment they're not. They are regarded as being confidential and they're not in the public domain. I've only ever seen one, and it didn't come from Hertfordshire, it didn't come from that far away, but it was a development that had been proposed. The local authority had laid down the requirement for 40% affordable homes. Somehow, I don't know how it happened, 
the 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 developers uh, consultants came back and said well it can't be done but a third party set of uh, consultants who got hold of the information they had a look at it and using the same exactly the same criterion or criteria they determined that even more social homes could be built than the developer said could not be built but did the local authority take this um, third view into account no they didn't because they couldn't afford to get into an argument with the developer because it would go to appeal and if they lost the, co the financial consequences could be quite grave so they caved in went with what the developer went and there were in a site of about 80 homes there were only six affordable. That's what happens in the real world. And unless these viability assessments are within the timetable for planning applications, and they are in the public domain, the degree of uh, community involvement in these decisions uh, will not be effective. Sorry, I'm end of question. Welcome. Paul Dean from Bishop Stortford has, has written so right, much. let's have Paul Dean next. And I'd like to ask a question in a moment. Good. Uh, do you want me to read my question? Please. Yeah, um, we, in the, the district plan for East Hearts has uh, 18,460 homes uh, to be built by 2033. Uh, 4,400, or about 25%, are, are in Bishop Stortford and already have planning permission or outline planning permission. So I'm interested, I think we're interested in how this new process that is proposed in the uh, new planning document about um, the three categories of land, <coughs> uh, red, amber, and green. Uh, are, are they going to um, or put, up, put, put more uh, or make more land uh, net, available in Bishop Stortford uh, when we are already suffering uh, issues of sustainability, particularly with respect to transport and other support services, as you announced, uh, uh, mentioned in your presentation. Uh, I, I'm afraid I can only answer to that. Nobody knows. Thank you. Um, uh, all plans in, the, in today's world are reviewed at uh, five yearly intervals. Yeah. And I have a funny feeling that that review will increase housing numbers in most places. It certainly won't decrease them. Uh, that's almost impossible to do. Um, but um, um, I, I, I don't think there's any good news um, in any of this. Uh, but I, I, I don't, uh, there was nothing in the white paper about what would happen to existing plans moving into the, which are there. Uh, and he starts, was it 2031 or is it 2033? Forgive me, I don't remember. 2033. 33. So is, is it all put off to 2033? I, I somehow doubt it, but we don't know. But we wait the government's uh, guidance on this, <coughs> I'm afraid. Thank you. Right. Perhaps I can ask my question next. Or it's really a point for you and perhaps also for Julie Marson. Um, I worry that in recent years, the quality of living in newly built or converted housing has been eroded. And only the other day, Peter Norman for the Hartford Civic Society was commenting on a planning application to convert some industrial housing, some industrial buildings into housing. And this was in a setting where there's so much environmental noise, no one can ever open a window. And, and that development will need mechanical ventilation. Um, it's really not a suitable site for people to be living. And I worry that this introduces a new sort of lowest common denominator in terms of quality of housing, which is also shrinking in size. Um, I don't know if either of the two of you would like to respond on that. Well, well first of all, the, 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 the best known of these um, ghastly um, converted office uh, blocks to homes is, is in Harlow, where there are three or four of the homes which were obviously in previous storerooms so they're very small and they have no windows. Now, the, the government has actually put a stop to that. It has changed the permitted development uh, rights to remove that ability. So um, ventilation has to, it has to be improved in any sites which are going to be converted. Um, 
it's vitally important uh, for most most uh, places uh, that, that w we know there there's a, been a bit of a move out of town centers. I mentioned shops. Uh, there are some offices that are moving out, although trying to find office space, ground floor office space anywhere in the county, as we know, because we're trying to find some, is almost impossible, um, at least at a price that a charity can afford. Um, but uh, there, there is a move um, uh, away. There's some consolidation. Um, uh, we know that, uh, well, at the moment, I think there's a strong suspicion, uh, which um, I share, that the new normal, there are not going to be so many people in offices when it resumes. Um, it's, you know, geography has no part to play in this sort of meeting um, and uh, all sorts of other meetings that I go to. And I think that will be important. Um, uh, Chris has just joined us and he's got a large team of people to manage. So, um, you know, uh, we, we, we can't just do everything virtually. It will be beneficial when we can get back to um, uh, um, water, um, you know, point uh, discussions the exchange of ideas, but um, conversion of uh, empty properties to dwellings in high streets is very much on the cards, but the standards have to improve so to make those dwellings um, fit for human habitation. Um, uh, we, we don't know enough yet to be sure that they are, but the worst of it has been uh, re removed. Um, Malcolm, if I, if, I, if I could just add, um, you know, that I was going to refer to Harlow as the blueprint of how not to do that. Actually, it's the it's the perfect example of what not to do, and and I don't want to sound trite, but what the government it, we can't stay still. We do need more housing. You know, we we do need more housing in this com in this country, and what the government in in a nutshell is trying to achieve. And I know there's a long road, and we might disagree, and we might be changing the route. But the government's trying to build more homes in the right places, uh, avoiding building on our green belt, increasing local participation, and building designed. Uh, homes of the best quality we can, and also trying to remove power from the, some of the big developers as well. There's a there's a huge amount in this, and there is a lot to, to take in. But as I say, it's it, that's the aim, and it's a good aim. But of course, we've got a long way to go in terms of how to how to get from from where we are now to to that what I hope will be a good position. But I'll leave it there. But get back to me with your comments. Now, we, we've also got a question from Sandra Kiriakides. Hi. Yes. Um, question for Julie, please. Julie, why is it when we know that there is a decline in numbers, surveys have shown that the OAN is actually less than it was estimated to be in 2014 and that the 2018 figures are much more realistic? And yet the government inspectors are insisting on building to the number that they feel is right, even though they don't know the area or the needs or the infrastructure, despite the genuine objections, not nimbyism, but just genuine objections put in by local people and authorities to say we don't have the infrastructure to support this number. And yet they are still insisting. That can't be right, Julie. Um, and we have this problem in well in Hatfield. We can sustain 14,000 or just under. We cannot sustain 16,000. And yet the inspector is pushing for 16,000. We don't need it. And they're going to be empty houses. Why do we have to do this? Well, I agree with you. What we want is local people buy in for local plans, which are then respected at every level, including the planning inspector, because you're right. He's not, a, he's not listening. <laughs> uh, no, and I agree, I agree. There are issues with that. We've seen issues with that locally. Um, and that's an, that's an issue that we really need to be addressing. Um, but of course, and, and also locally, obviously, we have uh, ambitious housing targets and we have infrastructure that we need to put in place to deal with that, that, that you know, you can't look at houses in, in isolation. There are all sorts of knock-on uh, impacts from those. And I'm very well aware of, of, you know, trying to get that right locally. And what we can't do is, is make mistakes either locally or nationally with that. But, but there is an, um, a big picture as well in terms of 
relieving pressure from the, the southeast as well, where the pressure on homes is actually disproportionately felt. Um, for instance, what we want to do is move some of the economic activity to other parts of the country where there is more space, there is more prospect for regeneration. And my, in my view, on a, big, on a bigger level, that's a really positive thing because that will take some of the pressure um, off of the southeast and off of to Hartford and Stortford. So I'm all for that. Absolutely, but it doesn't solve the problem now where an inspector is about to give a, a decision uh, on a one-size-fits-all basis when it doesn't. Who we're do working, we, we have, we have... Fight? Who do we complain to? How do, how do we stop this? Well, uh, the, 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 sorry, the Well in Hatfield plan, that's all, I'm not trying to defend a planning inspector, but the Well in Hatfield plan was based on the 2014 numbers. Um, so when it's being um, subject to inspection based on the, 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 that uh, original use of the 2014 numbers, that is not the case in decorum. Decorum um, is they're coming forward with their plan after the deadline for when, when uh, the old, that used to be in place. But decorum is still going to use the 2014s. We've got the ludicrous situation at the moment where the uh, the planning this planning guidance tells local authorities to use 2014 numbers and the national planning policy framework tells them to, to local authorities use up-to-date information yes, which yes. will be 2018 numbers so there's a conflict at the heart of the planning system yes, uh, yes. I, I, I'm, I'm not uh, going uh, um, off a, a deep end am I Alison or, or Chris about that no. No, you're right. that's right you're on, on message sorry Julie <laughs> A slightly different question from Hilary Laidler about housing size. Hilary, would you like to formally put your question or point? You need to unmute yourself. Yes, sorry. I've been very aware that a lot of people are working from home, across my family, locally and everywhere. And some people have been lucky enough to have a large enough house or a spare bedroom to do that. But if you take the population as a whole, I would think the problems, even when the children are back at school, of trying to find office space is going to require a different consideration when you build the original home. So if we are expecting not to travel to save energy, possibly we must have obviously better insulated houses if we're going to be living in them all the time, 24 hours a day. We also need more space so that there's not so much stress. You're absolutely right. I mean, there are concerns about the size of homes built in this country because the standards we have here for um, home sizes is, is much lower than elsewhere in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, I'm old enough to remember Parker Morris standards. Uh, Mr. Yes. Parker Morris was, uh, was the chief planner for Westminster, the city of Westminster, city of Westminster Council. So you wouldn't exactly, exactly expect him to be a, a rabid socialist, but uh, his Parker Morris standards uh, did ensure that homes were a reasonable size. But I'm afraid that was stopped a long time ago by a prime minister. I think her name was Thatcher. Yes, I was going to say, around the council houses were very much larger than some private houses being built then. Uh, yes. So we, we, the, the standards that a, a developer has to adhere to, dwellings can be very small, mm. very small indeed. But it is a problem, I agree. Um, there's a one BBC journalist, I forget who it was, was it a cricket correspondent, who said he was broadcasting from his loft? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, if design's going to come in, it's designed for use, isn't it? Back yes. to Morris. Yes, absolutely. Malcolm, Vicky Glover Ward. Certainly. Yes, let's by all means have Vicky's point, which is about also on the infrastructure side of things. Mm. Vicky, would you like to formally unmute yourself and make your question? Um, absolutely. Um, so um, I'm chair of the Kingsmead Neighbourhood Plan. Um, we've just done our survey and we know that there are children commuting from the east side of Hartford all the way to Buntingford or Stapleford because those are the nearest school places. Now, we already have a problem because one of our two schools was knocked down to build housing on. Um, so that didn't really help. Um, but where is all the new schools, et cetera, et cetera, going to come from, given that there is an inadequate number of places locally already? Um, I'm afraid it's, there's, a, there's a problem at the heart of all this. Um, it's local authorities, um, East Hearts District Council um, in, in this part of the world, who's responsible for um, housing, where housing goes. 
all that sort of stuff. But it's the county council that is responsible for it, uh, for education. Now, the, 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 they are supposed to cooperate. Um, it's not quite in the uh, the absence, but the, the, they work to different timetables. And this is even worse with the NHS because the NHS works to completely different timetables uh, than local authorities and indeed county councils. There's been some talk. Mark Prisk, when he was uh, the MP, uh, was the leading advocate of having uh, to being a unitary authority, which would at least bring together development with um, of of housing and roads and education. So you pull a lot together. Although um, a lot of people, myself included, worry about the democratic deficit if you've got a single local authority for what is it, 1.2 million people. Mm -hmm. Malcolm, John Goodeve has put a few words on the chat. Right, Malcolm, let, let's go to uh, Councillor Jan Goodeve. Uh, would you like to unmute? No, yes. I was just sharing a, a few bits of information. Um, one was that um, the consultation on permitted development rights that's ongoing, there's going to be a response from the heads of planning from across Hertfordshire. Um, it's felt that um, if they speak with one voice, it's going to be a more powerful voice. Um, Julie's quite right. We have had um, a residential application for an additional story on the house in the middle of the street, which is going to look completely weird. But given that it was built after 1948, um, and it's not in a conservation area, the council does not have the grounds to refuse permission. We are increasingly getting applications to convert um, buildings on industrial estates to residential, where there is poor public realm. Um, but again, we're, we're struggling to find grounds to refuse it on because we know that if it goes to appeal, we're gonna lose. And um, if we seem to be acting unreasonably, um, we will have costs. Um, design codes, um, we do have a design review panel which has a look at the major sites, um, which is independent of the council. On viability, um, where there is something that's a bit contentious, the council does hire um, somebody who is independent of the developer and independent of us to give an opinion. Um, in one case recently, we also had um, um, a clawback put in to the um, planning permission so that we can have a look at the end of build to see whether or not there is scope to um, get some additional section 106 contributions. Um, we're doing what we can. Um, we did submit a very um, extensive commentary on the um, planning for the future white paper. There's lots in it that, that we're very uncomfortable with. Um, as is clearly the case across the country, given that there's been 44,000 uh, um, comments submitted. But it is a white paper. It's out there for consultation and, and hopefully that government will listen. Certainly what we're hearing is that there is going to be some considerable rowback on things. Vicky mentions an important point on places at schools for children locally. Um, for the larger sites, um, and more recently, we've been putting together a spreadsheet of um, permissions that have been given and also conversions and liaising with um, the county council so that they've got a clearer picture as to what properties we've got in the pipeline to help them plan better for the future. I'm aware that there are some school places at primary level available at St Andrews in Hartford. I know that's not on the east side of town, which is... Uh, where you are, but at least it's a bit closer than Buntingford. But at the end of the day, if there's a place in Buntingford and parent prefers that to St Andrews, that that's their choice. But I don't know, maybe you've got some specific examples that um, we can loop back on that um, subsequently, perhaps. Um, I think that's it for now. Thank you. <laughs> Malcolm, Peter Norman had a most interesting point. All right, yes, I haven't seen that one. So let's hear from Peter. <laughs> We're getting towards the close now, but there is still a final opportunity for one or two people. And let's hear from Peter Norman next, please. If you yes, can unmute yes. yourself, Peter. I, I think I'm unmuted already. Um, yeah, um, 
My, my question, I suppose, partly to, in response to what uh, Ms. Marsden said, was if the government are keen, as, they, as she says, to ensure that development takes place elsewhere to uh, relieve pressure on the southeast, why then does the white paper not make any mention of strategic planning at the national level? It, it simply, simply doesn't raise that issue at all. Nobody can answer. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it needs to be taken with. I think I think you're probably right in the sense of um, maybe the, the the white paper hasn't asked for, for as part of the consultation process hasn't asked for response on that big question. But I think if you take it in um, conjunction with the government's levelling up agenda and um, that's implicit in what we want to do and and I think that has been also recognised in the change that was made just before Christmas due to, to basically lobbying from from people like me um, about absolutely moving the focus to urban areas to brownfield sites and to parts of the country that we really want to see growth and regeneration. We've got Colin Arnott um, waving a hand. Colin, would you like to unmute yourself? You might be the last person or the penultimate otherwise, depending how long your question is. Thank you. Um, I'm a colleague of Paul Deans at the Bishop Stalford Civic Federation. I'm also, also for my sins, uh, a town planner. I have been for, uh, for about 55 years, actually. Um, um, my concern, and I did write a note uh, uh, early on, on on the notes, that this is a housing white paper, not a planning white paper. We're, um, and it's in danger of sacrificing everything else within the planning system to simply trying to solve a housing problem. And clearly there has been a housing delivery problem, but in a way that, to, to quote the words of the opening words of the white papers, to make... Um, uh, the housing uh, the housing sector more competitive. I'm boring enough to have actually done a word count in this white paper on how many times the words homes, houses, dwellings get a mention. Or house, uh, and the answer is 217. Uh, the number of times that all other uses, which have been touched on several times during during the presentation, Business, industry, hotels, tourism, leisure, education, recreation, warehousing, logistics, storage, in total is nine. Nine versus 217. This white paper has absolutely nothing to say about comprehensive or integrated planning across across all uses. If we need a, a white paper, and, and, and it's certainly true that Oliver Letwin's work was far, far more useful in 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 appraising what is really wrong with the um, with with the um, uh, with the housing housing provision uh, in 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 the UK. Uh, then that's a better place to look than looking at changing, really throwing out the baby in the bathwater with with the housing system, and indeed converting it to a zoning system. Um, uh, I think early on in, in, in Richard's presentation, he, he tried to present what, what is a very crude and basic uh, housing system. For my sins, for 10 and 20 years, 10 to 20 years, I worked in Hong Kong under, under a UK government, mostly in that time. I was there one in converted Chinese government, which actually works, uh, works with the zoning system. And the idea that you can uh, pres prescriptive, uh, without being totally prescriptive about what you do uh, on on all land uses um, within uh, within within that zoning system, and they have a system of outline zoning plans, which don't look like plans as we would understand them to do at uh, um, at the moment. It's much more like um, uh, a permitted development schedule. If you've ever looked at Schedule Two of the permitted development, which goes on for something like hundred pages now to try and specify what is and what isn't allowed. Uh, rather than being subject to an individual actual application looked at on a case by case basis, you it it, it is just a, com a completely and utterly radically different system for uh, for for trying to establish a pattern of development. It's very useful, um, and indeed, when the Chinese government government came in, they thought this was a wonderful system for excluding any level of of consultation, for being totally prescriptive up up front. 
um, and, uh, and and indeed have, have, have adopted it for most of the uh, large scale development across uh, ac across China. Anyway, I'll get off my uh, <laughs> I'll get off my uh, my horse at, uh, at the moment. But this is simply will not work. Uh, it is um, uh, a, uh, a a nut. I'm not saying that, um, uh, that, that the housing problem is a nut, but this is a sledgehammer which is just aimed in completely and utterly the wrong direction. Uh, the, um, the United States is well known for using uh, zone uh, zones. Yes, it's, a, it's, a, it's a zone. To, it's a, in fact, Hong Kong copied the. Uh, uh, d despite having a, 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 a that a correspondent noted that when in New York State, when they changed the basis of their, uh, uh, they they. Uh, came out they published 600 pages of guidance on exactly. using the zoning system within i think two years it had more than doubled in size um so d please don't think that the zoning system is going to be um quick easy or simple to implement it ain't going to be we're quite a, we're not quite as litigious society as the united states but nonetheless we're good at bureaucracy thank you richard i i think we've reached a, a good sort of roundup point um, we've had a very interesting seminar as well as a very instructive presentation. Um, so I think we've had a, a good balance between the two parts of this evening's event. And I'd like to thank everybody for joining in and providing questions and uh, to thank you, Richard, very much for um, <coughs> taking on this big and complex issue and Julie and many others for, for chipping in with their views. Um, I think we've all learned a lot, I certainly have, in what is a very complicated field. And it's one where we have to hope that there will be some further improvement. Um, but for now, I think we're drawing to the end of the day, the end of the evening. Um, uh, and, before it's before been a great we finally one. close down, mm. can I just make the point? We have recorded all of the discussion. Mm. If there is any participation participant in the discussion who wouldn't want their views dispersed or widely you know, displayed on our website or elsewhere, would they please let me know? Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Yes, we do routinely uh, record these events now so that if you can't catch up sort of when they're happening on them, um, you can at least attempt to see them afterwards. And, and they're interesting to have a look at. Um, so thank you everybody once again because I think that really is it for now oh, S oh Sandra's got a quick available? one will the slides be available sorry will the slides be available um, I think you'd have to ask Richard separately but the presentation is available as part of the recording thank you so okay. that's probably enough for you um, I suspect so thank you and good night to all Good Thank, night. You Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. <laughs>